As you are uh, settling into worship this morning, let me invite you to turn with me uh, to Matthew's Gospel, which is the first book of the New Testament, and we're going to be uh, reading from <clears throat> the 20th chapter, um, a familiar, perhaps, uh, parable to some. Um, it's uh, one of the many that we're going through in this um, series on the parables. This one, we return back to this motif of kind of agriculture and working in the fields, in this case, laborers in a vineyard, uh, which is a kind of a motif that Jesus turns to many, many times. So he, uh, Matthew tells it this way. He says, for the, Jesus is speaking, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. And going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. All of this, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the way, the very unique and powerful way that Jesus could make everyday ordinary experiences like hiring day laborers to work in the field come to life in profound ways. So Lord, as we grapple and wrestle with this concept of your generous heart, I pray that you would help each of us Wrestle with our own hearts, Lord, and our tendency sometimes to begrudge your generosity. Lord, speak, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, do you remember your first job? How many of you remember your first job? Yeah, most everybody, right? I remember mine very well. I was uh, the ripe old age of 12 when I got my first job. And uh, uh, I went to work for a, a gentleman who had a landscape company. Uh, a buddy of mine and myself got, got kind of weekend jobs uh, working for this guy. And he managed several commercial properties, including a lot of apartment complexes. And he hired us to help him. And we ended up doing menial work. <laughs> a lot of pulling weeds all day long, in beds, in the heat of a Florida summer. All day long, we pulled weeds in beds. But at the end of the day, we would get paid the princely sum of $10 for the day. For the whole day, we got $10 for our hard work there in the scorching heat of a Florida summer sun, pulling weeds in apartment complexes. And uh, now you, you, you would think we, we would have known better, right? We, 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 but we were pretty, pretty happy to be getting 10 bucks in our pocket back, and it was the 1970s, so $10 went a little farther than it does today. But still, you, you would thought that we would have had a little more sense about us than to agree to getting paid 10 bucks to just pull weeds all day in the hot sun, right? But we did. And we didn't necessarily complain about it. We didn't, I don't think we knew better at 12 years old, but we had a job. We were making some money. We thought that was pretty cool. And so we didn't necessarily grumble 
about getting paid so little for all this. I, looking back on it, I think the guy was really taking advantage of us, but whatever, right? We didn't necessarily grumble about it at the time. Not so the, the guys in the parable that Jesus tells today in this story who feel a sense of sort of a miscarriage of justice and a, and a distinct sense of unfairness and imbalance about the way things are handled uh, in, their, in their labor situation. They were, uh, like a lot of folks, just looking for work, needed a job, and, and presumably there was some place uh, similar to our culture where you can find folks who want to work for the day, want, need, need, need some work. And so this master, this landowner in the story goes out and he finds some laborers to work in his vineyard. Presumably it's the harvest time, right? And you, you, it's crunch time. You need workers. You need help getting that job done. And so he goes out and he hires a group. Well, he determines, I guess, either they're not working fast enough or they're not getting enough done. And he realizes he has a limited time to get the harvest in, so he's got to go hire more workers. And so he keeps going back and finding more workers who are willing to work, including ones that, that basically are, are, are there still at the end of the day when the sun's starting to go down. And he realizes we haven't gotten all the harvest in. We haven't gotten all the grapes off the vines, so i got to get more labor on site. And that's what he does. And, and, and there is a, a, a sense of unfairness to this because when he goes to settle up with the workers at the end of the day, he pays everyone the same amount. Not the same hourly wage, wage <laughs> the same amount. The same amount to the guys who started early in the morning and worked all day, and the same amount to those sort of slackers who were just hanging around idle all day, and only come put in an hour or two at the very end of the day. He pays them the same amount, and the, the, the guys who get hired first are upset about it. Understandably, right? Their sense of fairness is offended, as ours would be. Amen? I mean, imagine if you were the ones that got hired first, and you saw this happening. You would say, wait, you, I, I would, I'd probably be like this guy, say, wait a second, that doesn't seem quite right. We might even file a complaint with the HR department or the better, you know, the equal opportunity employer or somebody, right? We would, we would try to find some recourse to get justice for our cause. Well, before we get too worked up, let's try to understand a little bit of the context of why Jesus tells this particular parable here in Matthew's gospel. If you back up a little bit, in the chapter 19 of Matthew, there's a couple of encounters Jesus has back to back that lead into and set up his telling of this parable. The first of which, Matthew tells us that he's, he's at a place where parents are bringing their kids to him. And they're bringing their kids to him and he is receiving them. He is blessing them. And he's saying, let the little children come. Let them come for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he blesses and receives these little ones. And right on the heels of that experience, there is this young man who happens to be quite wealthy who comes along and talks to Jesus and says essentially the same thing that the lawyer that we looked at last week says. In other words, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And there's a conversation that ensues that's very similar to the one we looked at last week. Except that at the end, he says, I pretty much kept all these things. I've done all the right stuff. I've checked all the right boxes. I'm a good, faithful person of faith. And Jesus says, except for one area. Your wealth has got a hold on you, and you need to get rid of it so that you can be free. Give it away and come and follow me. And Matthew tells us that he went away, how? Sad, right? He went away sad because he had great... In other words, he said no. He basically said that's too much to ask. Because what he was looking for, like the lawyer last week, he was looking for the formula. I need to know what do I need to do to get my life in order so that God will accept me, so that I'll check all the right boxes and I'll punch my ticket to heaven. And he and, and, and the lawyer last week and another character are kind of all wrestling with the same thing. That other character in Matthew's Gospel, is Peter. Because at the end of that encounter, when this guy goes away sad, the disciples are sitting around going, if this guy can't get in, and he has all these resources, and he's been faithful, who qualifies? And Jesus says, well, <laughs> humanly speaking, 
it's not possible, but with God all things are possible, right? And then Peter asks his own version of that familiar question. He says this in verse 27 of Matthew 19. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? What's in it for us? What's our reward going to be? Like, we've done it. We're doing the good stuff. We're checking all the boxes. We're being faithful. So what's in it for us? Peter and the lawyer and this rich young guy are all grappling with the same thing, this human tendency that we have, all of us have, to want to try to figure out what the formula for life is so that we can achieve the maximum benefit for ourselves. Right? Come on. Are you with me? All of us do this at some level. Sometimes it's subconscious. But we all have this human tendency to want to see if we can figure out what the formula to life is so that we can leverage that formula for our own maximum benefit. We're kind of like (laughs) the nobleman in Tim Keller's story from his book, The Prodigal God. He tells this story. It's kind of a parable-like story. Once upon a time, there was a gardener who grew an enormous carrot So he took it to his king and said, My lord, this is the greatest carrot I have ever grown or will ever grow. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. The king was touched and discerned the man's heart. So as the gardener turned to go, the king said, Wait, you are clearly a good steward of the earth. I own a plot of land right next to yours. I want to give it to you freely as a gift so that you can garden it all. And the gardener was amazed and delighted, and he went home rejoicing. But there was a nobleman at the king's court who overheard all of this. And he said, my, if that's what you get for a carrot, what if you gave the king something better? So the next day, the nobleman came before the king and was leading a handsome black stallion. He bowed low and he said, my lord, I breed horses and this, this is the greatest horse I have ever bred or ever will. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. But the king discerned his heart and said, thank you, and took the horse and merely dismissed him. The nobleman was perplexed. So the king said, let me explain. The gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. We all want to give ourselves the horse, don't we? (laughs) If we're honest. It may be understandable, but Jesus drives home the message that even though that's a, that's a, a sort of a normal and perhaps even a little bit understandable human tendency, it misses the point, the whole point of what he's getting at. And he turns that notion on its head when he says at the end, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. How does that even make sense? Because we live in a world, right, We live in a world where we are indoctrinated and taught from the very earliest days of our life here on planet Earth that you get what you work for. You achieve what you produce. And your merit and your value is based on what you can do. And what we end up doing is importing that way of thinking and melding it with our understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God. Which is to say, I have to do some things. I have to be a certain way. I have to behave a certain way to get in, to get the boxes checked, to get God's favor. You will never understand the radical nature of what Jesus is talking about when he says the last shall be first and the first shall be last, unless and until you understand it's all about grace. Unmerited favor. Grace in the morning, grace in the midday, grace all day long. It's all about grace. And I know sometimes it's hard for us to grapple with that. I know it's hard. But the truth of the matter is, none of us deserves anything. God doesn't owe you anything. And grace is what he gives. He doesn't owe it to you. He doesn't owe it to me. 
but he gives it freely. And grace is getting what we don't what we don't deserve and not getting what we do deserve. Because what we deserve, owing to the selfishness and the desperate wickedness of your heart and mind, what do we deserve? We deserve judgment. And what we get instead when we come to God, when we encounter God in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, what we get is not so much judgment, but generous, lavish, abundant, amazing grace. Hallelujah. That's what we get. It's a revolutionary truth that will absolutely change your life once you come to terms with it and understand it. It can be hard, though, once we have kind of encountered it and given ourselves to it, and we've walked in it a while, if we've been a Christian for some period of time, sometimes we can lose sight of that reality. We can lose sight that it's really all about grace. Because again, we import this kind of cultural value and this cultural norm of performance and merit-based value into our faith life. And we think, well, I made the choice I gave my life to Christ. I, I, I've been doing what you should do. I, I, I go to church. I, I give generously. When there's a, a, a food drive for the food bank, I go to the grocery store and I get stuff. I go to the Bible studies. I show up at Sunday school. I do all the things you're supposed to do to be a good Christian. Right? Right? I know, I done left preaching and gone to meddling now, hadn't I? But it's true. We slip into that, oftentimes unawares. But we slip into that kind of modality of thinking, if I just do all the right stuff, then I've made the grade. The problem with that, one, it's not biblical or true, but two, it sets us up in a position to look upon our friends and our neighbors not with grace, but with judgment. About that friend or neighbor, right? Who has made one poor choice after another, after another. That friend or neighbor who has squandered many opportunities who have come their way, who have made a mess of their finances. That friend or neighbor who has, who has gone through a difficult situation where they've lost custody of their children or their marriage has imploded or they've had an affair or an abortion or had any number of disillusioning, disheartening and even sometimes self-destructive experiences in their life and our tendency is to look upon them and us and say, why do they get a second chance? They're not doing the right stuff like I am. Sound familiar? It should. Because it is reminiscent of another parable that Jesus tells. Perhaps a more famous one. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. But as I've said before, it should be more accurately termed the parable of the two prodigal sons and the generous father. Because if you remember that story, the prodigal son, the one that the, the, we typically name the parable after, is the one who goes off, makes a bunch of poor choices, blows all his money, lives a wild and crazy life. And his father's heart is grieved. And when he decides, finally comes to his senses and he decides to come home, what does his dad do? Runs out to greet him. Basically casts off all restraint, all sense of honor, doesn't care what his neighbors think. He goes out and he runs to greet this son. And he throws a big party for him. Meanwhile, the older brother, the responsible one, the one who is doing everything right like he should, comes in from the fields and hears there's a, there's a, there's a party going on. Like, did I, did I miss something here? And he comes home and listen to his... Reaction in this moment from Luke chapter 15, 28 through 32. But he, that is the older brother, was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. Notice that. 
the father runs out to greet the son who was gone and who had messed up his life. And he runs out to greet the son who thought he had done everything right. They're both lost. His father came out and treated him, but his fa- he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this, this, this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours but it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this brother, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. That father in that story is the father we know in heaven. A father whose heart is so full of generous grace. And the question I I want to invite us to grapple with today, if that's God's heart, if His heart is full of generosity and grace, is ours. Is our heart like our dad's heart? Is our heart generous and gracious towards the skeptic, the cynic, the atheist, the agnostic, the angry one, the hurt one, the depressed one, the homeless one, the struggling one. Is our heart a heart of gracious generosity or a heart of callous judgmental? Jesus shows that the heart of God in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, the prodigal son, and so many other places, that the heart of our Father is a generous, gracious heart that reaches out to, that runs to meet, and welcomes home all of us. The ones who have been far away and wasted our lives, and the ones who have wasted time thinking we got it all right. He is gracious and generous to all of us. Even the ones we might overlook or not notice or even write off. Like Trevor. Trevor is is an individual that writer and theologian Henry Nouwen talks about in one of his books. I don't know if you're familiar with Henry Nouwen's work, but he's written a great deal of very helpful stuff on the Christian life and spiritual life. Henry was a a lecturer, theologian, very well known at Harvard and Yale and and elsewhere, and he kind of made a name and a reputation for himself, but he felt God calling him in a new direction in the last season of his life. And so he left all of the, the sort of the glory and fame of the academy, and he went to live in a community of developmentally disabled individuals. And he went to live there, and there was one young man who was there who was quite mentally ill by the name of Trevor. And the community at one point determined that Trevor needed some more intensive help than they were able to provide, at least for a short time. So they sent him to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation and treatment. And Henry wanted to go see his friend Trevor. So he called the hospital and said, can I set up a lunch where I can at least come have lunch lunch with Trevor? And when they found out that the the renowned Henry Nowen was coming to their hospital to have lunch, they saw an opportunity. And so they they asked if it would be all right if if they had a luncheon, and he kind of gave a talk, gave a lecture on some topic. And Henry agreed because he was going to be there anyway to see Trevor. So he agreed. And so they they, they put the word out that Henry Nowen was going to be there on such and such a day, and they were going to have a big luncheon in the, in the, 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 spe- they called it the golden room. It was this special kind of banquet uh, conference room in the hospital. Very special occasions happened in the golden room, so they, they, they scheduled it. 
And they invited all the doctors and cl local clergy and, and all these folks from around the community to come here, the great Henry Nell, and give a lecture at their hospital. So when the day arrived, Henry went to the hospital and he got there and they escorted him to the golden room and he looked around and he didn't see Trevor. And he asked the person in charge, where's Trevor? And she said, well, uh, <laughs> uh, patients and staff are, are, are not allowed to, to eat together. And, uh, and, and, and no, no patient has ever eaten in, you know, in, in the golden room. And if you know anything about Henry Nowen, he's a very gentle, kind of quiet, meek man. He's not very confrontational, but he just felt the Holy Spirit speaking into his spirit over and over again, saying, include Trevor, include Trevor. And so he turned to this person in, in, in charge and he said, look, I came here. The whole point of my coming here was to have lunch with Trevor. If he can't come to lunch, then I, I, I can't stay. Well, they had invited all these people. So they didn't want to cancel the lunch. So they put their heads together and figured out some way to uh, make it possible for Trevor to come have lunch. So all these successful MDs, PhDs, notable people in the community come together for this great lecture and luncheon, and Trevor was there. And the luncheon gets started, and, and it's going on, and, and Henry's seated at the head table with, with uh, Trevor on one side. And in the middle of this, uh, uh, and everybody's a little nervous, but, but he's turned, Henry's turning and, turned and talked to uh, somebody who was seated on the other side of him, and he didn't notice what was happening. But at one point, Trevor stood up at the head table and he raised his glass and he said, a toast! And the room got very awkwardly silent. And he said, started to sing. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. And, and, and the whole room was quite unsure of how to respond in this very awkward moment. All of these brilliant uh, MDs and PhDs could, couldn't quite figure out how to wrap their heads around how do we respond to this, this man with, with certain mental health challenges and so forth. And he just kept singing. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. And soon, all these highly educated, very successful, high achievers in the room started singing. Very softly. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your And soon the whole room filled with their singing to the point that they were almost shouting. And finally it died down and Trevor sat down and Henry Nowen gave his lecture. But people afterwards said the lecture was great, but the moment they remembered most and that touched them the most was when Trevor stood up to make his toast. And that happened because Henry modeled the heart of the Father, a heart of generosity and grace. Some say God is generous to a fault. I don't think so. How about us? Let's pray. Lord, for those of us especially who have been on the journey for a while, who have been followers of Jesus for a long time, it can be easy, even though we don't intend it to be, it can be easy for us to slip into modes of criticism and judgment and exclusion because someone is not where we are or looking or thinking or behaving like we think they should. God, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would give us hearts of generous grace like yours to people no matter who they are, where they are, what their life has been like. God, break our hard, calloused hearts and give us soft, tender hearts but just like yours, Lord. Help us to love like you love, care like you care, share like you share. 
and live like Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray together. Amen and amen.